if you'll take out your message notes, one of the big myths in Southern California uh, is that everybody here is laid back and easygoing. Yeah, right. You know, that Southern California vibe, the Beach Boys, it's all copacetic. Yeah, it's also a haven for workaholics. And surveys have shown that Southern California residents would actually rather work than pray, play, or pray, for that matter. <laughs> And uh, studies actually have shown, surveys show, that we actually prefer employment over enjoyment. And all this good weather creates a lot of workaholics. And the truth is, a lot of people don't know how to relax. We are addicted to adrenaline. We don't know how to slow down. And that's true of actually all of Americans. Studies have shown that the average American today is sleep deprived that the average American today gets two hours less sleep a night than we did 50 years ago. We don't know how to relax. We don't know how to rest. We love to work. A lot of Americans are like Job 20, verse 18. Here on the screen it says, message paraphrase, they are unable to relax and enjoy anything they've worked for. So busy getting more. I want to do a little quiz to see if you are a workaholic. (laughs) Be truthful, no cheating. Now you have to raise your hand on this, okay? Uh, Are you always in a hurry? Hmm. Is your to-do list always unrealistically long? Me, yeah, that's me. Do you use days off to catch up on unfinished work? Hmm. Has more than one person ever told you to slow down? Do you feel guilty when you relax? I've got so much to do. Do you have to get sick to get time off? (laughs) You know you're a workaholic when all your Christmas cards come back from business associates. You know you're a workaholic when you head out for back to school night and you don't know which one your kid attends. You know you're a workaholic when you wear a beeper to church or leave your cell phone on for texting. Hmm. You know you're a workaholic when your family refers to you as occupant. And you know you're a workaholic when you take business-related reading material into the bathroom. (laughs) I remember many times, many years ago, a lady said to me, she said, you know, Pastor, I I tried to call you all day Monday. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but Monday is, it's my day off. It's my Sabbath. And she said, well, the devil never takes a day off. (laughs) I said, yeah, and if I didn't, I'd be just like the devil. So you want me to take a day off. I'll never forget the first year of Saddleback Church. I really was working 18 hours a day, and Kay was too, uh, to begin this baby church. And the first two years of Saddleback Church, actually, twice a week, Kay cooked meals to have people in our home from the church. We had every member of our church in our home at least once the first two years of Saddleback Church. That ain't gonna happen anymore, friends. (laughs) Not all 35,000 of you. But I remember she cooked the same meal Tuesday and Thursday twice a week for two years. I learned to like it. (laughs) But we were working hard, 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 18 hours a day, and at the end of the first uh, year, I stood up to speak on the last Sunday of the year and fainted. And I was just worn out from exhaustion, physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, in every area. And uh, over the next year, God had to teach me some things about balance in life, which I actually have had to learn over and over and over again. I don't think you ever permanently learn these things. But God gave me a verse at the end of the first year of Saddleback. Uh, It's up here on the screen. It's Exodus 23. And this is what God said to 
uh, the Israelites when they were going to go into the promised land. He said, I'm not going to give you everything I've promised you in a single year because you're not prepared to handle that much blessing. And it would be too much for you to manage. Instead, you'll take possession of what I want to give you little by little so that you can grow. Then you'll be strong enough to handle it all. That verse changed my life. It's what I call pacing growth. Rome isn't built in a day and neither is a church or anything else worthwhile. And God doesn't want you to accomplish it all at once. He wants you to learn pacing growth, little by little. That while God is growing your business, he's growing you. And while God is growing your children, he's growing you. And while God is growing your career or whatever else is in your life that's important to you, he's growing you. And he says, I want you to learn this little by little, pacing growth. The fact is, God considers rest as important as work. Some people think only God smiles on them when, uh, when they're working or praying or doing spiritual things. God smiles on you when you rest. Did you know that? If you've ever, as a parent, gone in and watched your children sleep and the joy that that, that gives you just watching them sleep, God enjoys watching you sleep. God rests. God rests. Are you busier than God? The Bible uh, tells us this on the screen, Exodus 31, verse 17. One day a week, God says, will always serve as a reminder that I made the heavens and the earth in six days, and then on the seventh day I rested and relaxed. Now why did God rest and relax on the seventh day? Well, he certainly wasn't tired because God doesn't get tired. God, God never gets tired. But he was modeling for us what he wanted us to do to rest and to relax, to keep a Sabbath, to have balance and to relax in, in the goodness of God. Now we're in this series we've just started called Living in the Goodness of God. And we're looking at Psalm 23, which, which actually models for us um, 10 ways that a good shepherd takes care of sheep. He feeds, he leads, he meets their needs. And the 10 ways God's goodness wants to benefit you how god wants to take care of you and a lot of your worry and a lot of your hurry and a lot of your scurry and a lot of your restlessness actually comes from not understanding the goodness of god in your life and when you understand what god has done for you and wants to do for you in the future you can relax you can learn to rest you can learn to let down you can learn to to let go you can live in the goodness of god now in that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd psalm, he gives us 10 things that the shepherd does. And one of the things that a good shepherd does is they make sure the sheep get enough rest in order to stay healthy. And that takes us to verses one and two. Let's look at it again. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have everything I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. Now, you might want to write this down. These images are actually a metaphor. They, they, they represent rest and refreshment. When he makes me lie down in green pastures, that's rest. And when he leads me beside quiet waters, that's refreshment. Now, notice, I want you to circle the word, he makes me. Has God ever had to make you lay down for your own health's sake? So because you wouldn't slow down? If you won't lay down, God will make you lay down. And sometimes the only way God can get you to look up is lay you flat on your back with an illness. And God will do that because he's the good shepherd and he cares about your health, your physical, emotional, spiritual, every area of health. I want you to write this down on your outline. To give God my best requires rest. To give God my best requires rest. If you don't have rest, then you're going to be stressed. In fact, the difference between being blessed and being stressed is often rest. Isn't it amazing how much better things look after a good night's sleep? The difference between being stressed and being blessed is often rest. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down when I don't even want to. 
Have you ever seen a kid, a, a, a child, frantically trying to stay awake? You know what I'm talking about? And, just, and, their, and their eyes are closed, but they're trying to stay awake. Resistance to rest is immaturity. It's immaturity. Now, I've got a confession to make uh, because I always preach every week. I always preach these messages to me first. If it doesn't hit me, I don't figure it's going to help you. Uh, but if it helps me, I go, okay, that'll probably help somebody else. And so this message, I need to hear this message on relaxing in God's goodness. I've had a couple of very frantic weeks where I had eight outside messages to deliver, speaking engagements outside of the area. I told you last week I was at the National Prayer Breakfast and I spoke five times at that. And then I went uh, to another place and I spoke to the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities, to all the leaders of the Christian schools around America. Then I went and I spoke to a, a youth pastor's gathering. And, and I, I have been overstretched the last couple weeks. I need this message. So if you get anything out of it, congratulations, but I'm really preaching it for me. Okay, so uh, if you want to take a nap, you might get more benefit out of it. Then uh, just put your head on the shoulder of the person next to you with their permission, um, and I'll, I'll wake you up at the end. As I said, rest is often the difference between being blessed or stressed. And when we look at Scripture, we see that God rests. We see that Jesus rested many, many, many times. He had advances and retreats, advances and retreats, seven of them in his three and a half year ministry. Jesus rested. If you're going to be like God, if you're going to be like Jesus, you've got to learn how to rest. I have to learn how to rest, how to relax, how to relax in the goodness of God. Now, that's what I want us to look at today. How do you relax in God's goodness? Before we do that, I just want to mention why do people overwork? I mean, we need to get to the source of our stress. Why do we overwork? Why do we not get enough rest? Well, the Bible's full of many, many examples and reasons why you get stressed instead of blessed because you're not at rest. And the Bible gives us many, many examples and reasons. Let me just give you five from the Word of God, and let's see if any of these might be causing you to not get the rest you need, to not relax like God wants you to relax in life. These are just some of the common reasons from the Bible. Number one, uh, the first reason the Bible tells us that people don't relax is this, misplaced identity. And that is basing my worth on my work. Basing my worth on my work. Now we fall for this all the time. One of the reasons why people can't relax is they confuse their work and their worth. They confuse their net worth with their self-worth, their value with their valuables, and they think, you know, if I work real hard, I succeed at work, then I am valuable. If I don't work, I don't produce, I'm not productive, then I'm not valuable. And that's a total lie. It's a total myth. But in Western culture, our identity often revolves around our work. So we overwork in an attempt to prove ourselves and if I achieve a lot, then I must be worth a lot. I must be valuable. I must be important. I must be significant. But your significance has nothing to do with your job or your career or your achievements, in fact. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 15 says this. Only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. Hmm, that's pretty frank. Uh, you might want to put that on a card and put it on your windshield there, okay? <laughs> Only someone stu too, too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. He says, life is more than work. Yeah, it's important, but it, your life is far more than the work you do. It's just a portion of your life. But when we have a misplaced identity and we think our worth is based on our work, then we're going to put all of our time, our money, our energy, our effort into our work. Number two, second reason people don't relax is materialism. This is obvious, always wanting more things. And when I gotta have more things, then I gotta make more money, and when I've gotta make more money, I've gotta work harder and longer hours. And yet the Bible says not to do this. Proverbs 23, verse four and five, warns, warns us about materialism, and it says this. Do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. 
have the wisdom to show some restraint. Your money can be gone in a flash, as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. He said, you know, you can lose your money. Don't, don't spend all of your life trying to get something you could lose so quickly. He said, you can fly away like an eagle. Now, evidently, America's founding fathers wanted you to remember this because they put an eagle on every dollar bill <laughs> as a reminder uh, of this verse. It has been my observation, having counseled thousands of people, that we spend the first half of our life uh, sacrificing our health overworking in order to get wealth and we spend the second half of our life sacrificing wealth in order to get our health back have you ever thought about that the first half of life you 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 give up your health in overwork in order to get wealth but in the second half you spend all that wealth trying to get healthy again this is not wise Always wanting more things. In Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus says this. Watch out. Always be on your guard against all kinds of greed because your life is not defined by how much you make or how many things you own. So materialism, just like misplaced identity, caused me to overwork. A third cause. In the Bible, it says that envy can cause you to overwork. And that is wanting to be like other people. I'm trying to keep up with the Jones. I'm trying to keep up with my neighbors. I'm trying to keep up with everybody else. And that will cause me to do things that I don't really have the time to do. Too busy trying to keep up with others. And that's envy. You know, their kids have dance lessons, so we have to have dance lessons for our kids. And their kids are involved in these five extracurricular events, and so our kids have to be involved in these five extracurricular, uh, not necessarily. Uh, you know, I, my, my girlfriend is on social media all the time, so I better be on social media all the time. A and we do things we don't need to do because other people are doing them. Now, Solomon noticed this problem of envy literally thousands of years ago. In Ecclesiastes 4, 4, he says this, I've learned why people work so hard, why they work so hard to succeed. It is because they envy the things their neighbors have. I want to be like them. I want to have what they've got. I want to do what they do. I want to go where they go. Well, they may be under stress more than you, so make sure you're following the right model. Envy. Number four, a fourth reason why people don't relax, according to Scripture, is when we value achievement over relationships. When we value achievement over relationships. And men, we're, we're more prone to do this than women, but everybody can do this. Where you put your career above everything else, including relationships. We all know people who've walked away from marriages because of their career. Or they've walked away from uh, being a good parent or just being a good friend because the career was more important. The work was more important. And when goals are more important than people in my life, or when goals are more important than people in your life, you're skating on thin ice. Again, here's what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And remember, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And he says this. Here's another thing that I've seen on earth that makes no sense. Some people don't have any kids or family or even friends, in other words, no relationships, yet they work obsessively, never taking a break. There's no end to their toil, and they're never content with what they've done or earned. They never ask, and then he asks some very important questions that uh, if you're in this category, you probably ought to ask them yourself. They never ask, why am I always working to do more? Why am I always doing that? Why am I always working to do more? And why don't I let myself enjoy life? And here's the big one. Who cares? Who cares? Who will get what I leave behind? I don't have any relationships. So what's this big career that I'm working for and amassing you know, accomplishments and achievements and a pile of money? Who cares? Who's going to get what I leave behind? What a senseless and miserable way to live 
He says, you're better off having someone to enjoy and share the rewards of your work. When I value achievement more than relationships, God did not put you on earth to mark things off your to-do list. He put you here to learn how to love. He says that over and over in Scripture, to learn to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and to learn to love your neighbor as yourself. Tom preached a classic sermon on this three weeks ago. That that's what matters. Not how many accomplishments I have in life, not how many achievements I check off in life, not how many goals I reach in life. When you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, tell me your goals and did you reach them? He's just not going to say that. When you get to heaven, God's going to say, tell me about your relationships. Did you get to know me? Did you get to know my son, Jesus Christ? Did you love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? And how about other people? How, how did you score on relationships with other people? Because you, you can hit home runs all day and strike out in relationships and God's saying, ah, wrong answer. Sorry, you missed it. I did not put you on earth simply to accomplish goals, to make a lot of money, to do really cool things. I put you on earth, first of all, to learn to love. And you can't learn to love if you don't have any deep relationships. Wow. This is why we don't relax. Misplaced identity. I base, base my worth on my work. So I pour all my energy into that. Or materialism. I always want more, so I got to get more money to get more. Or envy. I want to be like what other people are like, and so I'm following their ridiculous lifestyle too. And they're stressed out. Or I value achievement over relationships. He goes, why am I doing this? They never ask why I'm always working to do more. Why don't I let myself enjoy life? And who cares? Who's going to get what's left behind anyway? There's a fifth reason that people don't relax. And it's insecurity. It's insecurity. Insecurity is when I'm afraid I won't have enough. I'm, I, I was once sitting at a dinner table with some people who were fabulously wealthy in, in the multi-million dollar category. And, uh, and I asked that person, so how much more do you think you need to be secure? And, and, and the guy looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, mm, about 20, 30 million more. I'm going, he has no idea that when he gets that he's gonna say it's not enough. Because it's never enough. You cannot have security if it can be taken from you. And you can have a lot, a lot of money and it can be taken from you. But it's always more. And I'm insecure and I'm afraid that I'm not gonna have enough. So I keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working. Here's what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 6, 7. I love this in the message. We work to feed our appetites, but meanwhile, our souls go hungry. Bam. Our souls go hungry. Does that sound familiar? I'm so afraid I'm not going to have enough physically, materially, that I'm giving up my spiritual depth in order to get it. We work to feed our appetites, but meanwhile, our souls go hungry. Or how about this verse, Psalm 127, verse 2. God says this, the Living Bible. It is senseless, senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing and worrying. There's the reason, insecurity. Fearing and worrying that you won't have enough. For God, let's read this aloud together. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. So go home right now and take a nap. <laughs> all right? That's probably some of all you need as, as we looked at the causes of our difficulties. So how do, you, how do you do this? How do I learn to relax? How do I live a more sane life, a more balanced life, a less stressed and more blessed life? Instead of living a restless life, how in the world do I live a rest filled or restful life. Well, I'm going to show you the antidotes to all five of these because God in his word gives us the antidote to every one of these causes. What do you do? Well, you trust your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. I have everything I need. He makes me lay down in green pastures 
and he will lead me beside still waters. If you're following God, if you're following the good shepherd, Christ, he's not gonna lead you in the pathway of the rat race. He's gonna lead you to lay down in green pastures, and he's gonna lead you beside still waters. Signs of tranquility and peace. How does he do that? Here are the five antidotes. Number one, remember my value to God. That's the starting point for getting a more sane schedule. Remember my value and my worth to God. This is the exact opposite of basing your worth on your work. It's the opposite of basing your identity on your career. Now this is so counterculture because when you go to a meeting and somebody says, who are you? One of the first things they ask you is, what do you do? As if what you do is your identity. And the first thing you tell them is your job. You don't tell them about who you are, you tell them about what you do. But he says, if you want to get off the, the rat race, remember my value to God. Okay, how valuable are you? Well, let's think about this. The Heavenly Father created you, which means God doesn't create anything without value, and God doesn't create anything without purpose, and God doesn't create anything without intention. The fact that you're alive means God loved you and wanted you alive. So the Heavenly Father created you, that's your value. You're priceless, you're a masterpiece, you're unique. Nobody's ever made like you. God didn't make any clones or copies. So the Heavenly Father created you. Jesus died for you, that shows your value. Jesus didn't die for junk. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. God puts his spirit inside you when you trust him. All three of those show incredible value, incredible worth. I want you to write this down in your outline. It's not what I do that gives me worth, but who I belong to. It's not what I do that gives me my worth. Because what happens if you're disabled? Then all of a sudden you have no value anymore? No, it's not what I do that gives me my worth, but who I belong to. Now for some of you, this is gonna be a major change in your thinking because you grew up feeling, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody, I'm not priceless, I'm not a masterpiece, I'm not unique, I'm not extremely valuable. Yes, you are. But growing up, somebody told you, maybe a teacher, or maybe a peer, or maybe even a parent, said, you're, you're nothing, you're nobody, you're worthless, you're never gonna amount to anything. And in the back of your mind, you filed that tape, and ever since then, you've been saying, I'll show them, I'll show my mom, I'll show my dad. And that is driving you to work, 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 work. Now, this is true of everybody. But for some of you, this is the motivation. That little voice that says, you've got to prove you matter. You gotta prove you're not normal, you're not ordinary, you're not average, you're, you're a superstar. Maybe you were even compared to a brother or sister, or you were compared to your parent, or your dad, or your mom. Why can't you be like? And that has driven you and driven you to overwork, and years later, you still hear that inner voice, and the truth is you can't afford to take time off because you gotta keep paddling. And you're paddling up a stream and the stream is coming the opposite direction and you have to prove your worth. No, you don't. You don't. You don't have to prove your worth. You're already extremely valued. God created you, Jesus died for you, the spirit lives in you, you're unique. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You don't need their approval to be happy. You don't need their approval to be worthwhile. God says you're worthwhile. Jesus' death says you're worthwhile. The spirit living in you says you're worthwhile. What in the world are you afraid of? The antidote to this building my worth on my work is to remember my value to God. You'll never be any more valuable to God than you are right now. You'll never be any less valuable to him because he made you, he's your father. My kids are valuable to me, not because of what they do, because I created them with my wife. And I love them. And it doesn't matter who they are, what they've done. It's 
They're my creations. You are God's creation. James chapter 1, verse 18. This is what God says about you. God decided to give us life. That's a big deal. Through the word of truth. The word is Christ. So that we might be, circle this, the most important of everything God has created. Do you realize you're more important than the moon? Do you realize you're more important than the Milky Way? Do you realize that in God's eyes you're more important than all of the extinct animals combined? Did you know that in God's book you're more important than all of the rare flowers? And all of the trees? And all of the beauty of of all the other creation. Look at that verse again. God decided to give us life through the word of truth so that we might be the most important of everything God created. You matter more than the rest of creation. So what does it matter what somebody else says about you? If God likes you, they, they got a problem. So you can relax. And one of the reasons you don't have to work is you don't have to prove yourself. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. He made me. He made me. He wanted me. He loves me. He created me. And he made me just the way he made me to be. And I don't have to be somebody else. I remember my value to God. Isaiah 48, verse 16, God says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And we've talked about this cherished verse many times. When Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and those nails went through his hands, God permanently showed how much you matter to him. When you get to heaven, the only person in heaven who's going to have scars is Jesus Christ. So for the rest of your life, you'll be able to see, in eternity, you'll be able to see how much you matter to God. I love you this much. You matter to me. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. That's how valuable you are. God has a tattoo of you. When people fall in love, sometimes they'll get a tattoo of their lover, their girlfriend, or their husband, their wife. God has a permanent tattoo of you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Why in the world are you trying to prove your worth through your work? You're already infinitely valuable according to the cross. And at the cross, he says, this is how much you matter. I want everybody right now to just close your eyes, okay? Just close your eyes for a minute and and think inside yourself and take a deep breath and just say, Father, help me to feel loved by you. Just say that, Father, help me to feel your love. And then say, Jesus, help me to feel how valuable I am to you. And then say, Spirit of God, help me to feel how important I am to you. Amen. All right, so the antidote to looking for the work as your worth is to just realize how worthwhile you are to God. Are you broken? Yeah. Are you a sinner? Yeah, so am I. Uh, Are you perfect? Absolutely not. Are you deeply loved by God? Yes. Are you flawed? Yes. But are you infinite value? Yes, also. I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. Why are you trying to throw or feel your work, a worth, through your work? You don't need to. Number two, second step, and this is the antidote to materialism, which is always wanting more and more, and it's this, enjoy what I already have. If you'll learn to enjoy what you've already got, then you can get off the rat race. Now this is called being content. Contentment does not come natural to human beings. You are not by nature a contented person. By nature, we are discontented. By nature, we are not resting sheep. We are restless sheep. And by nature, we are discontented. We always want more. We always want something different. And yet it can be learned. In Philippians 4, up here on the screen, verse 12, 13, Paul says, I've learned. Notice, contentment is something you learn. You can be educated in it. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. 
Whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him, that's Christ, who gives me strength. So learning contentment means I don't have to have this incessant grabbing for more, grabbing for more, grabbing for more. Can we become so preoccupied in getting more we don't enjoy what we have? Yeah, yes, of course. You know, it's amazing in Southern California. Uh, you, you go down to the beach or just any place and you find these amazing homes over the top, beautiful homes everywhere. But the people are never around to enjoy them because they're always at work. Because somebody's got to make the payments on those massive house mortgages. It's what I call the saddleback syndrome, and I've, I've watched it for over 30 years. Uh, and, and what it is is we, we get extended with the desire to acquire. I've got to have that. I've got to have that. I gotta, and the desire to acquire pushes you to buy something you really can't afford, particularly a, a, a mortgage that's over your head. And then you get overextended financially, uh, and then you have to constantly hustle to make ends meet because you're overextended financially. And, and soon, because you're overextended financially, your re relationships start to deteriorate. And then you don't really even have a reason for that fancy home. The Bible says this, Ecclesiastes 4, 6, up here on the screen. A little food eaten in peace is far better than having twice as much earned from overwork and chasing the wind. You know, it, it's better to have a little in peace. The greatest things in life aren't things. I couldn't count the number of deathbeds that I've stood by where people took their last breath. And in all the years that I've been a pastor, I've never had anybody say in their dying breath, man, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> I've never heard that one. Man, I wish I'd spent more time at work. And I've never ever actually had anybody ask for a particular object or thing that they loved, valued, or worshipped. Please, bring me my bowling trophy. I want to see it one more time. <laughs> Please, bring me my degree from community college. Please, bring me... Uh, 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 I want to see my coin collection. Nobody's ever said that in their dying moments. Nobody ever asks for things in the final moments of their life. They always ask for people. Because eventually, everybody learns that it's all about relationships. I just hope we learn it before the deathbed. You're gonna learn this one day when you're dying. You're not gonna ask for any, show me my car one more time. Show me my fancy television screen or my how. No, you're not going to ask for it. At, at the very last moment of your life, you're going to realize it's all about people you love. Loving God and loving your neighbors yourself. Can we not learn that sooner? It sure relieve an awful lot of stress. It would sure make life more fulfilling. It's not about achievements. It's not about accomplishments. It's about relationships you know I've said this many times you're not going to take anything with you you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul <laughs> if you laughed at that okay they laughed it <laughs> how many times have you heard me say that thousands thousands of times that's what I thought you're never going to see a hearse pulling a U-Haul you're not taking it with you you know, it's so funny. In America, it's considered a tragedy to, quote, die penniless. You know, oh, she died penniless. What a better time to go! <laughs> I mean, really, the moment you spend your last cent, boom, I'm out of here. I call that wise, not stupid. I'm out of money, let's go. That's just brilliant living, if you ask me. And then it still irks me. You can still see those bumper stickers around everyone. He who dies with the most toys wins. Are you kidding me? We need the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys still dies. 
And he didn't win anything. In all likelihood, he probably lost a lot of relationships building up those toys. Valentine's Day is this week. So guys, I thought I'd throw in a verse for you. Ecclesiastes 9, 9 on the screen. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. <laughs> That's the verse for Valentine's Day. Memorize that one. Ecclesiastes 3.13 says this. All of us should enjoy what we have worked for. It is God's gift. God says enjoy what you've got while you got it. Enjoy what you have while you've got it. Look at this verse up here on the screen. Matthew 6, 31. I love this in the message paraphrase. Jesus says, you know what I'm trying to do here is get you to relax. To not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. Did you realize that relaxation is a spiritual issue? That resting is a part of trusting. Resting is a part of trusting. Resting is the way to blessing. Okay, remember my value to God. And then number two, enjoy what I already have. Stop trying to get something else, just enjoy what you got. Number three, this is an important one. Limit my work to six days a week. You say, you're kidding me. I'm saying, if you're not doing that, you're breaking one of God's big 10, the 10 commandments. Rest and recreation are so important to life, God put it in the big 10, the 10 commandments, right up there with don't commit adultery, don't murder, and don't steal. He says every six days you take a day off. If you're not taking a day off every week, you are breaking the 10 commandments. You say, well, I'd never murder anybody. I'd never commit adultery. But are you taking a day off every week? It's right up there in the Big Ten. That's how important God considers rest and recreation and relaxation. If the bow, you know, like a bow and arrow, if the bow is never unstrung, you never unstring it, it loses its power. It loses the tension in the bow. Our best requires rest. Now, this is the fourth commandment. And when God gives a commandment, he's serious about it. This is not like an option like, well, if you feel like it, take a day off. No, it's called the Sabbath. Let me show you some verses. Exodus 23, 12, here on the screen. Work the first six days of the week, but rest and relax on the seventh. This is the law, he says. This law is not only for you, but all for, also for your animals, so your pet needs to have a Sabbath, <laughs> as well as everyone else, including foreigners among you. God says, I don't want anybody unprotected from this law. And he said, this law of rest and recreation and having a Sabbath, having a day off every week, he said, everybody should be protected from overwork, including immigrants and foreigners who have come in. They shouldn't be overworking either. Now here's the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 9 and 10. This is one of the Ten Commandments, fourth commandment. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is to be a day of complete rest. Circle that, complete rest dedicated to me. Now this is called the Sabbath. Every seventh day you take a day off. And a Sabbath, you might write this down, Sabbath means a day of rest. That's what it means. And uh, you know, did you know that your heart actually beats different, different every seven days? We're, we're biologically wired for a day of rest. Now this whole idea of where God says, I want you to have a day of rest and worship, it's not for God's benefit. It's not just some arbitrary law. God did it so you won't burn out. And the reason people are so stressed out today is they've forgotten this. In culture after culture after culture after culture, it's for your benefit. Look at this, Mark 2, verse 27. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to benefit man. In other words, God didn't make the Sabbath for his benefit. He made it for ours. When I ignore God's laws, who gets hurt? Not God. I get hurt when I don't follow the owner's manual. Now, when is your Sabbath? 
I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what day of the week you take your Sabbath. The Bible says this many times in the New Testament. What day you worship on, what day you take as your day off, as your day of rest, your day of recreation, it doesn't matter the day, you just need to do it every week. Okay? My Sabbath is not Saturday, my Sabbath is not Sunday. I'm working on those days. My Sabbath is every Monday. It's Monday. And by the way, I would encourage you to not call it your day off because if you, you call it your day off, you'll cheat on it. You need to start calling your day off your Sabbath. Now, you say, well, what am I supposed to do on my Sabbath? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Write these down. Three things. Just find some place in your outline that don't, didn't give you a lot of space for it. You do three things on the Sabbath. I'm going to summarize about 10 hours worth of material. You rest your body, recharge your emotions, and refocus your spirit. Let me give it to you again. Number one, the first thing I do on the Sabbath, I rest my body. Now, you know the fact is if you don't take time off, your body will make time off. You can't just keep pushing it and pushing it. Do you know that in, during the little history note here, during the French Revolution, they abolished Sunday as a day of rest? In the French Revolution, they just abolished Sunday as a day of rest they later restored it because the health of the nation had collapsed. It just completely collapsed. They were all burned out. He said, but I feel guilty when I relax. Well, Jesus didn't. He, He followed the Sabbath. So you rest your body. The second thing you do on the Sabbath is you recharge your emotions. I recharge my emotions. Now, what recharges you is going to be different things. You can recharge your emotion through quietness, solitude. That's a good thing. Just be quiet. Turn off all the noise. You can recharge your emotions through recreation. And I would encourage you, I'm talking about recreation that rejuvenates you. I mean, if you get involved, I'm talking about non-competitive stuff, because some of you, you get in a competitive sport, you'll beat your brains out to win that. And, and that's not resting at all. You're, you're, the competitive spirit you had all week is now just being transferred to the tennis court or the golf course or wherever. You need to do something that is non-competitive that rejuvenates you so you're not stressed out when, quote, you lose. You recharge your emotions through quietness, through recreation. You recharge your emotions through relationships. Spend some time with people on your Sabbath. I rest my body. I recharge my emotions. Number three, I refocus my spirit. And that's what we do at worship. It's what we're doing right now. We're refocusing your spirit. Worship puts life into perspective. Now, you need not only time in group worship, but you need time alone with God worship. I'm telling you that you have to make a conscious decision to make time over the other things uh, besides work. And I would encourage you to think through, how many hours a week do I want to work? And then stick with it. And you schedule everything else. Why don't you, you schedule doctor's appointment? Where, are you scheduling recreation? Are you scheduling your Sabbath? I would encourage you to make it the same day every week. And, and schedule your time with family into your life and relationships. Now, let me tell you who this is especially important for. Those of you who are self-employed. Those of you who are entrepreneurs and you're self-employed. Uh, if, if you don't schedule it, you're never going to take a break. And you're going to bring homework with you. And, and uh, you bring it home in your briefcase. <laughs> I heard about a little girl sitting at a din- dinner table. And every day her daddy came home with a briefcase. And, and she said, what is that, daddy? He said, well, it's work I didn't get finished uh, at the office. She said, well, why don't they put you in a slower group? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Maybe that's what we need. Now, I want to tell you something. If you'll start obeying the Sabbath, taking a day off, um, and you'll relax as God tells you to. And you know what? This constant battle, it's on and off with me, it's on and off with you. Um, You know what will happen? You will actually end up with more time. God promises that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. He says, if you'll do it my way, if you'll take one day off a week, and it's to rest my body and recharge my emotions and refocus my spirit in worship, God says, you know what? I will give you more time. 
Look at this verse on the board, the screen, Proverbs 14, 30. A relaxed attitude lengthens your life. Envy rots it away. And what did I say? Envy is one of the reasons we, we overwork. I want what they've got. He says, instead of being envious, why don't you just get this relaxed attitude? It will lengthen your life. It will add hours to your day. Remember my value to God. Enjoy what I already have. Limit my work to six days a week. Fourth thing God says to do. This is your good shepherd giving you advice from his word. I, I must adjust my values. Now, why do I say this? Because to reduce the busyness in your life, you're going to have to change the way you think about what's important. And you need to ask the question. You might just write this question down. What is really important? What is really important? You've heard me say many, many times, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. You can't worry about keeping up with the Joneses or anybody else and live a life that's rest-filled, restful life. You can't worry about them and, and reduce your stress. Jesus gets right to the heart of this adjusting your values. Look at this verse on the screen, Mark 8, 36. What good is it? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? But look at all the stuff I accomplished with my work. How's your soul? Did you forfeit your soul? Did you forfeit your relationships? Did you forfeit loving God? Did you forfeit loving your neighbors yourself? What does a profit a man if you're on the cover of Time magazine and you lose your soul? I love getting letters from you, emails from you. And, uh, you know, I talked about stress and worry uh, last week. Here's a note I got. Pastor Rick, as I listened last weekend, it was like holding up a mirror to my face. I'd been filling my life with activities and even ministries to keep myself so busy that I wouldn't have the time to think about or face some issues that I really need to deal with. I know I'm not alone in realizing this, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you spoke about worry and stress and hurry. I think this series is going to be life-changing and life-saving for many, many people. I think it's going to save some relationships, some marriages, some friendships, some families, some lives. Thanks to this last weekend's message, I rested yesterday, and the world did not come to an end. <laughs> I read the entire Sunday paper for the first time in ages. I talked to friends without having to rush off somewhere to do an errand. I enjoyed watching my kids play with their friends. I sat in a room I had just redecorated so I could relax in it, but I had never sat in it or even just enjoyed it. I had just redecorated it. Most importantly, I talked to God a lot during my quiet moments, and I painfully admitted to him that I've missed my time with him. Well, that's the best thing that happened to me. It felt great to get back on track with God. And all day long, I found myself asking, what would have happened if I just sat still for two minutes? What would have happened if I just sat still for two minutes? What was I so scared of? It was great. And I know that there are probably some painful things that are gonna surface as I clear my schedule and my mind has to contemplate certain things. But if I'm close to God, there isn't anything I can't face because I'm not facing it alone. Thank you.
to prayer in so many of our lives. We just can't keep going at the pace we've been at. We just needed somebody to tell us it's okay to take time and rest and to not feel guilty about it because God never meant for us to live the way we've been living. Amen. Here's the fifth thing you need to do. I need to exchange my restlessness for God's peace. I exchange, I give up my restlessness. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lay down in green pastures. I'm gonna give up my tendency to roam, tendency to wander, tendency to veer off course. I'm gonna exchange my restlessness for God's peace. Let me close with a couple verses. Matthew 6, we looked at this last week when we were talking about worry. Verse 26 to 30, Jesus says this. Look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. And you know that you are worth so much more than those birds. You can't add any time to your life by worrying about it, and why do you worry about anything else? Look at the beauty of the wildflowers in the field. They don't worry or overwork. But God takes care of them. So you can be sure that he'll clothe you too. God cares for the birds. How much more is he going to care for you? God loves you more than you will ever, ever know. And there's nothing you can do that will make him love you any more or make him love you any less. And you see, what we're talking about here actually gets to the root of your workaholism and my workaholism. What this does, it gets to the root of your restlessness and your stressed outness. You know, there's physical fatigue, or you got, you know, your muscles are tired. And then there's emotional fatigue when your emotions are tired. And then there's spiritual fatigue when your spirit dries up. You need more than simply to go to sleep to cure those last two. You can go to bed, but that's not going to get rid of emotional fatigue. It's not going to get rid of spiritual fatigue. People say, well, I just need a vacation. Yeah, you might, but you need more than that. What you need more than a vacation is you need a relation, a relationship to Jesus Christ. In the 20th or 21st century, we're not made to live this way, the way we've been living. And as I said, the ability or the insistence of I'm trying to stay awake is what little kids do. It's a mark of immaturity. Maturity knows how to rest. I told you in the first week of this series that sheep aren't very smart. They're really one of the dumber animals that God created. Did you know that sheep don't like to lay down? They don't. They don't like to lay down. And yet it says, he makes me lay down. And if you don't slow down, God will make you lay down. Now, I challenge you to start working on this immediately. Plan your Sabbath. God's way is not only the right way. Uh, It's not only the healthy way. It's the enjoyable way to live. And if you are tired of living the way you're living, here's my answer to you. Come to Jesus. Last verse on your outline. Matthew 11. Jesus is talking, verses 28 to 30. In the message fair paraphrase, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me. Notice he didn't say, come to a doctrine, come to class. He says, come to me, a relationship. Get away with me, Jesus says, and you'll recover your life. And I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. This is my favorite line. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. As your pastor, I want you to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. 
I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You come to Jesus. He didn't have to load more on you. He's going to take it off you. Now, let me summarize what I just taught you. Look up here on the screen. Here are the five things. Remember my value to God. Enjoy what I already have. Limit my work to six days a week. Adjust my values and exchange my restlessness for God's peace. What does that spell? Relax. R-E-L-A-X. That's what God wants you to do. Let's bow our heads. Augustine once said, the beginning of good works starts with the confession of bad works. So why don't you confess to God what's caused you to overwork, to be stressed out, to be stressed instead of blessed? Maybe you'd say, God, I've had a mistake at identity. I've been basing my worth on my work. I'm sorry. Tell him that. I've been basing my worth on my work. And God, I've always been wanting more. I'm never satisfied. I've been materialistic. You've said, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Have the wisdom to show some restraint. And you might need to say, Lord, I've been envious. I've wanted what other people have. confess that I've let achievement be more important than relationships. Another thing on earth that makes no sense. And I haven't asked the tough questions. Why am I always working so hard? Why don't I let myself enjoy life? Who cares? Who's going to get what I leave behind? And maybe you need to confess insecurity and say, Lord, I I live with the, the fear that I won't have enough to make it through retirement or whatever. But today I wanna change. It's senseless for you to work so hard from early morning and to late at night fearing you won't have enough for God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Would you say, Lord, today I wanna learn to relax in the goodness of God. You are the good shepherd. I wanna lay down in green pastures I want you to lead me beside quiet waters. Help me to remember that my value to you is greater than anything else. That you love me unconditionally. That I don't have to prove anything to others. And God, help me to enjoy what I already have instead of always be reaching for more. Help me to limit my work to six days a week and to obey the Ten Commandments, it says, take a Sabbath. And where necessary, help me to adjust my values, to put first things first, and to focus on the major, not the minor things of life. Help me to take a day of rest every week. And today, I want to exchange my restlessness for your peace my pressure for your peace, my problems for your peace. I want to live in the love and goodness of my good shepherd. 
Say, Jesus Christ, I give every area of my life to you. I want to love you and follow you. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.